Peeps, Chris Godinez, licensed professional counselor, also the host of We Need to Talk with Chris Godinez on here on Facebook Live and then post it up to YouTube every Sunday at noon, although the YouTube one happens sometime during later. Uh, this video is for educational and informational purposes only. If you feel you need a therapist, please go to Google, type in therapy, your city, psychology today will pop up, click on that, and it will have all of the therapists in your area. Also, the views and opinions stated herein are mine and mine alone. They do not represent the ACA, the APA, or any other goddamn therapist for that matter. Boom, shakalaka done. All right. So today's topic definitely touched a nerve. So today's topic is aging parents and in-laws, how to cope. Oh, shoot. I forgot to do stuff first. Boise. <laughs> Boise went great. Oh my God. Thank you guys so much. It's such a great city and it's so friendly and we had such a wonderful time. And what was so amazing to me is even though it's a smaller city, we had just about as many people as we did in Atlanta, which was a pretty big crowd. So I'm like really impressed and amazed and grateful and honored and and half the crowd was men and i was like yes this is awesome i want to get it out there that narcissists are not just male they can be female and so same-sex relationships can have a narcissistic partner you know heterosexual relationships can have a narcissistic partner and it could be female the female could be the abuser that is absolutely happening so yeah so don't think that it's just you know only one sex could possibly be the abuser no it can be females as well and so i was very honored and gratified to see that there were men in the audience half the half the audience was men which i was like wow mind blown anyway it was great it was a wonderful wonderful trip and i just really enjoyed it the next uh the next venue is going to be honolulu hawaii so if you are in honolulu if you are uh on the oahu island uh please give chris my manager uh, an email um and let him know of any venues that you know of that are low cost no cost or you know a, a restaurant that we could do the back of the the restaurant in like we did this time so uh, that would be great. Uh, his email is uh, Chris, uh, or you could use my email, uh, Chris, K-R-I-S, at Mercury, M-U-R-C-U-R-I, dot com. So there's that. Um, also, ooh, a little housekeeping. All right, if you guys could please keep your questions to very, 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 very short because I've got interns reading through what it comes in and they only send me the question anyway. So I never see the story because let me just explain this. Narcissistic abuse is narcissistic abuse is narcissistic abuse. I don't need to know the story. Yes, your story is very, very important. I know. However, I, I've got a limited amount of time and my interns have got a limited amount of time. So just send in the tiny question. You know, you just can give me like a brief, maybe four or five sentences, kind of like, this is what's happening. Here's the question. And that would be very, very helpful because they only send me the question. So, and I'm not, I'm not seeing everything that comes in because we can't, there's just too many now. So um, if you could keep that super short, I would really, I would be grateful. My interns would be grateful. My manager would be grateful. That would be awesome. Okay. So there is that. Um, what else can I tell you? Oh, if you are interested in this lovely mug, which I'm not taking to Honolulu with me, there's no freaking way. Are you kidding me? So, <laughs> cause it's just too much. Um, these are available on eBay. If you are interested in buying one of these mugs, also the book is available. Both of the books are available on audible now, um, on, uh, amazon.com. So both of them are available. I believe on Audible, so I think I think this one is now up on Audible, um, and you can get these print on demand. These are available on um, Amazon.com, so you can get both of these on Audible. So there that is. Okay. Whew. Oh, Patreon. If you guys are interested in supporting me, you can go to Patreon and do a donation. That would be awesome because that'll help pay for all these trips. That would be great. Um, anything else that I can think of? No. Okay. Let's dive into the topic. Holy cow guys so apparently i really touched a nerve with this one so toxic parents and hello everybody <laughs> toxic parents aging toxic in-laws um this is huge so narcissists do not age well narcissists do not age well personality disordered people do not age well um, because they've got so much disordered thinking and because with a narcissist, especially if they are somatic in any way, shape or form, they're terrified of getting old, they're terrified of wrinkles, they're terrified of aging, they're terrified of dying, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so you will see uh, 
older narcissists just circling the drain. They, they become very demanding and very uh, nasty and very, um, you know, they, they flip, they flip flop. It's really crazy to watch. It's like they'll be horrible and nasty and terrible and vicious and mean. And then the next sentence they're praise Jesus. I'm, I'm with the Lord, blah, blah, blah. Cause they know that they're probably going to have a seat up front where it's warm. You know what I'm saying? So it's, it's, <laughs> it's like, they don't age well. They don't. And they are very, um, they, they start decompensating. They start de deregulating. It's hard for them to stay regulated. And their true selves start coming out. So when my mom was in her um, care facility, there were some people there that were clearly, clearly disordered. And they would scream at the staff. And they were not dementia patients, by the way. I want to make that very, very clear. Because that when... Oh gosh, this is such a huge topic. I'm probably going to have to make this a two-parter because I don't think I can get through it in, in two hours. So with dementia, people's personality change. The, the sweetest person can go to just nasty and vicious, and it's because their brain is, is dying, basically. That's very simplified. But um, So with dementia patients, they, they can be very angry, and they can have outbursts, and they can, you know, you know, hit and spit and things like that. And it's because their brain is dying. They, their parts of their brain are shutting down and not working. That is different than an aging narcissist or an aging malignant borderline. So with those people, they've got all their faculties. They know who everybody is. They remember the past. That's not dementia. Dementia, they, they don't remember the, the recent past. They can remember the distant past, but they can't remember the recent past. Their short-term memory is, is shot. Um, but what happens is, is with aging narcissists and aging personality disorder, malignant borderlines, malignant guys, malignant, I'm not talking the lower end of the spectrum, I'm talking the malignant end of the spectrum. What ends up happening is, is that their true personalities come out because they can no longer regulate, they can no longer maintain the mask, okay? It takes a lot of energy to pretend, and it takes a lot of energy to uh, to put on a scam and to put up a front and to pretend to be this, you know, sweet, kind, wonderful person when in fact they're not. So at the old age home, at the, at the care facility where my mom was at when she could no longer care for herself, there was a few that lived down on the same wing as her and we would hear them screaming at the staff and snapping their fingers at them and ordering them around like they were servants and, you know, don't you know who I am? Literally, that came out of their mouths. Mom and I just looked at each other and we're like, wow, really? So, um, yeah, they don't do well because they've never dealt with anything and they're losing power. They're <laughs> By the time a narcissist or a, a malignant borderline get into an old age care facility, they've lost power. They're losing money. They don't have people to boss around or put down anymore, except for the staff, which frankly, the staff doesn't put up with it, which I think is good. And actually these two people ended up getting shipped out because they were like, no, you don't get to talk to us that way, which I was like, I could kiss you. That's awesome. So they, they don't deal with losing power and control because really that's what it's all about for them. So once they get to that point where they are aging and they are recognizing that they are losing their power and control, they start circling the drain. They're, they're not going to do well. And or they become communal narcissists, which is the religious ones that are hallelujah, praise Jesus, I found God. I found God, but in the meanwhile, I'm still going to treat you like a piece of crap because I'm a piece of crap. Do you see where I'm going with that? And they just... Yeah. And, and so they flip flop. It's, it's like, it's like they flip flop between, I love you. I love you. I love you. I hate you. I hate you. I hate you. I love you. I love you. I love you. I hate you. I hate you. I hate you. Intermittent positive rewards. Hello. And it becomes blatantly clear who and what they really are. So aging narcissists, aging, toxic family, aging, toxic in-laws, very, very difficult to deal with. So tons of questions. I'm not quite sure where to start because everybody's been like, I seriously have gotten like over a hundred questions <laughs> from the time I announced that I was going to do this show to now. So, um, so let's start with toxic aging parents. I think maybe that's, that's a good way to start because that's going to explain the toxic aging in-laws as well. 
So toxic aging parents, they are desperate to maintain control and they're des desperate to maintain the status quo. And narcissists and abusers and malignant borderlines do not like it when the status quo gets upset. So they want everybody to stay in their neat, nice little boxes. So if the toxic parent has said, you are this, you are the scapegoat, you are the golden child, you are the ignored middle child, you are the comedian, you are, you are the savior, you are the this, you are the that. They want everybody to stay in those boxes. And when we don't, they don't handle it well. Abusers cannot handle change. It, they just can't. It doesn't, it doesn't jibe with their worldview. Their worldview is that they can control anything and everything, and they can't. The reality of the world is we are in control of one thing and one thing alone, and that's ourselves. But um, with a narcissist, they have the hubris to think that they can control anything and everything. And so when family members start changing, when they start changing, when, uh, let's say, the scapegoat marries, they're going to come unglued. They're, there's going to be a shit show going on because, well, that wasn't supposed to happen. Well, you're not supposed to be this way. And, or if the golden child marries, they'll want to control all of that. Well, you need to marry a doctor or you need to marry a lawyer or you need to marry this or you need to marry that or we don't like him or her because fill in the blank. So I went and saw the um, Crazy Rich Asians this weekend and it, awesome awesome movie. If you have not seen it, go see it. If, if nothing else, you're going to take a look at it and you're going to go, oh, for the love of God, I want to go to Singapore. So, um, because it was just, oh my God, it was like a love letter to Singapore. I'm like, ah! anyway, um, and I love to travel. So that's, <laughs> that's why I was like, I want to go to Singapore. But the point being is somebody had asked me, well, what is a good um, movie or TV show that shows gray rock? Well, I had a really hard time coming up with an answer to that because most movies and TV want drama. And the only way to get drama with an abuser is to play their game and to uh, you know, respond back to them in kind and blow up and come unglued and cry and be hysterical and this, that, and the other thing. So I had a really hard time looking for something that showed gray rock and then I saw Crazy Rich Asians and I was like, oh, brilliant, there it is. So in the very, very beginning of the movie, the, the main character, Rachel, is playing a poker game against a professional poker player. And she's, she's staying perfectly calm. She's not getting angry. She's not getting upset. She's not getting sad. She's not doing anything. She's just being her. And this plays out at the end of the movie as well. So she does a very similar thing with the mom. And it's, that's gray rock. That's, you know, she just states a fact, you know, it's like, here it is. This is what's going to happen. Here's how it's going to go down. And no, you're not going to get under my skin. And no, I am going to go back and have a wonderful life. And, uh, you know, there you go. And then walks out and picks up her mom and goes. And so um, that's a great example of gray rock. It's not a perfect example because she did engage the mom in some conversation, but gray rock is where you just simply, you know, my friend Lynn put it really well. It's like walking away into the sunset. It's like you give them nothing. It's, it's like, it's like, you know, it's like the, the villain or the, the abuser says all of these horrible things and you just kind of go, mm hmm. Oh, that's fascinating. Mm hmm. Yeah. Mm, I'm sorry you feel that way. Wow. Mm. And you walk away. Now, that's the only time I would ever say, I'm sorry you feel that way, is to an abuser because otherwise that's a narcissistic apology. But what it is, is that you don't buy into their guilt. You don't buy into their bullshit and you don't give them any sort of emotional response whatsoever. And to give them anything, anger, sadness, smirks, anything is giving them narcissistic supply. So what she does model for, for everybody in the beginning of the movie and at the end of the movie is she had no emotion on her face, nothing. She didn't smirk. She didn't, she didn't snark. She didn't, you know, do the Billy, Billy uh, idol lip, you know, you know, she didn't do any of that. She just was her and she was just stating facts and then she walked away into the sunset, which was pretty fucking awesome. So, um, and that's the best example of a gray rock I can give you in a movie or television. So that's a great movie. I, I loved it. It, it was, it was, it was one of those movies that took you on an emotional journey. And when she was being harmed by all these people, it was frustrating. You wanted to throw your popcorn at the screen, but then when she was able to maintain and be calm and just, you know, deal with it, you were like, Oh, go you girl, you just go. So 
anyway, and it, it, it was wonderful because there's a line in there. Aquafina says this line. Aquafina is this blonde Chinese comedian. She's hysterically funny. And they, they call her the, the, you know, they called her in the movie, the blonde Ellen or the Chinese Ellen. And um, she says this line to her friend, which I thought was great to Rachel. And she says, you know, these people are cowards. They're, they're chickens, you know, buck, buck, bitch. And I was like, I'm so going to use that. So yeah, it's, it's, they are, they're cowards. They're absolute cowards. And, and yeah, and she dealt with it perfectly. And, and that attitude of buck, buck, bitch, you know, it was great. So that's, that's gray rocking. So <laughs> go see the movie, Crazy Rich Asians, do it. You'll thank me. All right. So there is that. Um, so that's gray rocking. So when families have somebody else come into the family, they're going to try, if, if they're dysfunctional, if they're, you know, disordered themselves, they're going to try to figure out how to manipulate this new person. And they're going to try to either intimidate them, which is what happened in the movie, or they're going to try to win them over, you know, get them on to, oh, I'm really sweet. I'm really kind. I'm really this wonderful person when in fact they're not. Um, and they'll do all of this stuff. Now, once the son or the daughter, whoever is getting married, once that person starts pulling away from the toxic family, this is when the toxic family is going to pull out the stop and be completely insane. So they will start accusing the daughter-in-law or the son-in-law. And this goes for heterosexual couples. This goes for homosexual couples. They'll start accusing whoever the quote unquote interloper is of um, being the problem. You know, you're pulling this person away from our family. You're doing this. You're the problem. You, 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 you guns, huge red flag. Now where things get, dicey is that we are dealing with a son or a daughter, their son or daughter, who has been brainwashed, gaslighted, rewritten history for X number of years. And it is very difficult for that person to reconcile this mom and dad does not have my best interest at heart because we're trained mom and dad have our best interest at heart. Well, if mom and dad are healthy, yeah, they do. If mom and dad are disordered, no, they don't really not. And so what ends up happening is, is that conflict starts happening with the son or the daughter-in-law. And then the child of the disordered parents is forced into a position to choose. And this is what they showed in the movie as well. It's a no-win situation. And no matter which way it goes, it's not going to be good. Because if, if you hit it head on, well, the narcissist or the abuser wins because you forced the son or the daughter into a no-win situation and an ultimatum. That's where narcissists live, is in ultimatums. They live in ultimatums. It's me or the highway. It's either or. It's not an and world for them. It's not an and. They don't share well. They don't play well with others. I don't know if you've noticed this or not. Hang on just a second. So what they do is they force a, a, a no-win ultimatum situation onto either the daughter or the son. And it's, it's not good. And um, it, it's stressful for the, the son or the daughter of the people who are disordered. And it's stressful for the, the, the new daughter-in-law or son-in-law. So hold on a second. I wanted to answer some questions because I realize I've got a backlog here. Uh, my husband's ex was a narc and he didn't even know that there was a label for what was wrong with her until he got with me and started watching your videos. Oh, good. I'm glad. Um, okay. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Only sound can't see you. Is anybody else having problems? Cause that doesn't sound like anybody else is having a problem. Um, can the schmugs be shipped abroad to Europe? I'm not sure. I'll double check on that and then I'll get back to you. Cause I've had a couple of questions on that. Um, Okay. Uh, do, 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 do. What age do they start decompensating? It depends. So if you're dealing with a somatic narcissist, like the ones who are all about the, you know, the look, right? They can decompensate at a very, 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 very young age. So when I was working in Los Angeles, I had a Playboy bunny come in and she was 21 years old, gorgeous, like drop dead gorgeous, but you would never recognize her from her and the pictures because the pictures were so airbrushed and so worked over that you wouldn't even recognize her on the street. And here she was telling me all of these different surgeries, you know, cheek implants, chin implants, uh, liposuction, breast job, uh, butt cheek implants, liposuction on the thighs, you know, working out with a trainer six hours a day. 
and she's 21 and she's freaking out because she thinks she saw a wrinkle. What? Yeah, that's, you know, it depends. It, de it depends on the narcissist. It depends on who you're working with. It depends on what's going on. They can decompensate at any age, really. If they're somatic, it'll be younger because they can't stand the aging process. Um, it's when they start losing power and control. It depends on what their power and control is. If they're young and it's their looks, then as soon as they feel like their looks are going, that's when they start decompensating. That's when they start freaking out. That's when they start getting plastic surgery like nobody's business. You know, I mean, it's, it's crazy go nuts. So, but with the other narcissist, with a grandiose narcissist or a, a, a covert narcissist, it's when they sense that their power and control is slipping and they're clawing to get it back. So it, it depends, depends on the, on the abuser, depends on what their particular peccadillo is, so to speak. Um, how do we find peace in our hearts? I have to keep distance for my well being, but I would love to be there for them as they come to the end of their life. So here's the deal. Um, okay, you have to gray rock if you're going to have any contact with them at all. So here's the deal. I understand the desire and the need to be with somebody at the end of their life. I got it because we're, we're empaths. We, we assume that everyone is going to feel the same way we would feel if we were in their shoes. And that's what we do because that's what makes us awesome. Okay. Because we have the ability to feel, we have the ability to love. We have the ability to be empathic and go, gosh, how would that feel if I were dying and I were alone? How would that feel? And so it gives us sympathy or empathy for the person who is dying. So when they are coming to the end of their lives, there is going to be a part of us that is going to want to be there for them. The only thing I can recommend is that you make sure you have a damn good therapist, somebody you can vent to, APSA, freaking lutely. You make sure your boundaries are rock fucking solid because they're going to pull out all the stops, guys. They're, they're either going to be, forgive me for my sins because they're afraid of going to hell, or they're going to go, fuck it, I'm going to hell anyway. I'm just going to be a rotten bastard until the very end. You know, it, it who knows? Who knows? It depends on the person. So you, you protect yourself the best you can. If you are called, if your heart is saying, and your gut, remember, listen to your gut, not your heart, not your head, listen to your gut. But if your gut is saying, hey, I need to go be with them, you know, in the last week or two of their lives or whatever, or I need to be with them a little bit more for my own well-being, okay, that's great. That's As long as it's for your own well-being, if you're doing it to try to appease them or if you're doing it to try to appease family or to try to look good for friends, you're doing it for the wrong reasons. You do it for you. You do it because you want to be able to know that this is what you need to be okay for when they finally pass over, if that makes any sort of sense. So you, you ground yourself before you go see them, you make sure that you have somebody you can vent to, you make sure your boundaries are in place. You read The Disease to Please by Harriet Breaker, and Harriet Breaker had another one out there, uh, not being the strings, don't, uh, no strings pulled. Uh, that's another good Harriet Breaker book. So it's basically about not being manipulated by them and recognizing they are disordered, they're not going to change. You can have a sense of grace with that in that you turn it over to your higher power. It's like you can't fix them. You can't fix them because you did not break them. If you feel called to be with them, then you take precautions. You have your boundaries in place. You have your books ready to go to in case they trigger you. You have your journal ready. You do whatever you need to so that you are safe when you are having contact with them. And when you are having contact with them, you do not open yourself up and allow them to harm you. Again, that's idiot compassion. That is not compassion. So if let's say you go to visit them and let's say they're just horrible to you, walk away. Good luck. God bless. I hope your journey is a smooth and easy one and you walk away because you are under no obligation, no obligation to anybody. If a, if a relationship, I've said this before and I'm going to say it again. If a relationship has fear, obligation, and or guilt, which is the fog, it is not a healthy relationship. So you do not want to be doing something out of fear, obligation, or guilt. If you're doing it so that you can say goodbye to them, so that you can say, I forgive you if that's what you need to say, or 
no, I don't forgive you, but good luck in the next lifetime. Whatever, you do it for you. You don't do it for them. This is not this is not about them. It's about you. It's like, are you doing this from a healthy standpoint or are you doing this from a needy standpoint and from a fear-based standpoint, an obligated standpoint, or a guilt-based standpoint? Those are the questions you got to ask yourself. <sighs> okay. Um, all right. Hang on just a second. Um, all right. Yes, yeah, some people, okay, and some narcissists can fake um, dementia and they'll blame their bad behavior on that, just like some narcissists will fake having some sort of disease and blame their bad behavior on that. It's not, it's not surprising. Uh, okay, all right, hang on just a second. Okay, yeah, they are very nice to strangers, they can be, and then they'll be horrific to the family. That's another, that's another thing that they do, absolutely. So they'll be super sweet to the nurses and the doctors, because the nurses and the doctors are keeping their ass alive, but then when the family comes in, they're, you know, horrible, so, yeah. Um, okay, question. Okay, so when you deal with uh, a family member, an, uh, an in-law, and they are living in your home. They are disabled, they're older, they can't take care of themselves, they're not in a care facility. How do you deal with that situation and how do you deal with it with the spouse? Okay, this is going to be a huge one. So first and foremost, I would strongly, strongly, strongly suggest that you and your spouse get into some form of therapy because you're going to need it. And it needs to be somebody that understands narcissistic abuse and it needs to be somebody who understands toxic parents, okay? So the thing of it is, is that if we have that in-law move in, okay, they're gonna do their damnedest to break up your marriage because they're miserable and they want everybody to be just as miserable as they are so they are jealous they are self-centered they are not on your side they're going to I can guarantee this they are going to pull your spouse aside and whisper a bunch of crap in his or her ear and try to get him or her to hate you that you're the problem which is why I'm saying you need to get to um, a therapist and make sure that the two of you are on the same page so that there is no triangulation of communication going on so what narcissistic in-laws especially when they have moved into our home oh my gosh guys I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to get all your questions because it's, it's going up and I can't figure out a way to go back so um, if I don't hit it please do send it to me because I think this is gonna be a part two -er. um, so what narcissistic in-laws um, do is they triangulate communication and they will separate their child from you trying to get their child to hate you and they will fucking lie like a goddamn rug that's why I'm saying it is super important that you get with a therapist and you make sure that you and your spouse are on the same team and on the same page and that your spouse is dealing with the original wound which is now living with you honestly if it was me I would say nope we're putting her in a in a safe home in a home that is going to take care of her and she will be fine or he will be fine or whatever the situation is because the thing of it is is that it, it, you're constantly going to have to be on guard you're constantly have to be you know make an agreement that we will talk about everything that is said individually to each one of us because what the abuser will do is they will do the triangulation of communication. They'll go to this person and say, well, so-and-so said such and such, or, or well, you know, that person is da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. And what you have to do is you have to both be telling each other what you're both hearing, because if you don't, you're gonna start falling into that trap of believing the abuser. Now, this is going back to toxic parents. Toxic parents is the original wound. Toxic parents are the original original wound over here. So if your spouse has got a toxic parent, they are doing the same bullshit that they did when the kid was younger, okay? So that means they're gaslighting. They're lying like a rug. They are brainwashing, intermittent positive rewards. Believe me or I'll punish you. Believe me or I'll, or I'll give you the cold shoulder. Believe me or fill in the blank or else. Um, so you are dealing with all of that. Now, the scary thing of it is, is your spouse may have been super competent, Super adult, everything's great, you guys are wonderful. The in-law comes in, his mom or dad comes in, 
And your spouse will dis a fucking peer. I kid you the fuck not. And they will turn into whatever age, however little they were when the, the verbal abuse or the physical abuse or the emotional abuse or the mental abuse started. And your spouse will disappear and they will start siding with the in-law. They'll start siding with their mom or their dad. And that's why I'm saying this is a dangerous situation because if the spouse does not have a, a good enough sense of self and a good enough sense of, wait a minute, this doesn't feel right. I need to trust my gut. What's going on? Mom's pulling stuff. Dad's pulling stuff. I'm not quite sure. Let me check with my spouse. You know, they don't do that. What they do is they just so desperately, their inner child so desperately wants to believe that mom or dad is telling them the truth that they start siding with the abuser and they abuse by proxy. So dangerous situation, guys, dangerous situation. It's, it's really, it's not a good thing. Um, and it's really important to get with a good therapist that understands this. So if you were in the Phoenix area, Susan Charney is amazing. Susan Charney is fantastic. She absolutely has experience with this and she knows how to help the spouse starts separating and figure it the fuck out. So, but it can do a lot of damage to the relationship if you are not on it and you have to be on it all the time. So yeah. So, all right. Um, okay. Gosh, so many questions. So if you have a toxic in-law living with you, my suggestion is get them the hell out, get them 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 out, have them go live in a home. Yes. They're going to have a fit. Yes. They're not going to like it. Yes, they're going to make you feel guilty, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Either that or your, you and your spouse have got to be on the same page and it's going to be a daily battle because this narcissistic parent will not stop. They're like the damn Terminator. They will just keep going. And if one way of working doesn't get them what they want, then they'll try some other form of manipulation or power and control issue or whatever. And it's going to be a constant, constant battle. And it's never going to end until they're dead. So that's why I'm saying you really have to take into consideration, is it worth it? Is it worth it? Is it worth your marriage? Is it worth your sanity? And what I've seen narcissistic in-laws do is they will literally trap whoever they want to scream at and start screaming at them. And then when you go to tell the spouse, the spouse will not believe you because the in-law has immediately texted them or called them and said, I never did that. That never happened. Hello, we got a problem. Houston, we got a problem. So if that's the case, you get them out of the house. You get them out of the house, you do. And then you start working like crazy on your marriage and you start working with your spouse on the abuse that they went through with the original wound because it's not gonna work otherwise. Okay, uh, let's see what we got. Why can't I go backwards? This drives me crazy. Um, my dad didn't want me to move to Switzerland when I, was, when I was offered a job. I was 30. He told me if I went, he would disown me and write me out of his will. I said, go ahead, and then went no contact. Ah, good for you. Yeah, so golden children with toxic parents, they create boxes that we have to live in and when we step outside of that box and show them that we can no longer be controlled that's when they do the rewriting the wills if you don't do what i want you to do i'm going to cut you out i'm going to disown you i'm going to da 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 you know and it's it's like they do this because they are desperate for control and when they see you going off and becoming independent and sitting in your own power, that scares them because now they know you cannot be manipulated, you cannot be controlled. And since there's no money carrot dangling over your head, they can't manipulate you that way. So how are they going to control you now? So yeah, they often do that. Um, my mother had told me my whole life she didn't want me to care for her in her old age. She fought against anything we tried to do for her. We feel fortunate that we did not have to have her live with us. Um, yeah, you know, it's funny. It's like some parents really do do that. They, they want to be, my, my, my mom was very much like that. She did not want to go into a, a care facility. She did, She wanted to be independent. When my dad died, she really did change quite a, a, quite a bit. Her mother was a full blown narcissist and my dad was borderline personality disorder, malignant, like nobody's business. And when he died, she reveled in her 
aloneness. It, not lonely. She was, she never lacked for company. It's like everybody really loved her. And, you know, people would come by and visit and she'd go do stuff with people. And, you know, my sisters and I would all go up and visit her and things like that. And when it came down towards the end, though, you know, she recognized, she's like, I can't care for myself anymore. I'm fighting it tooth and nail, but I'm, I don't want to, you know, have you guys be forced to find me dead in the house, you know, so... So we decided to put her into a care facility and she knew that was the best answer because none of us could have physically taken care of her because she needed, she needed somebody to help her get up and she needed somebody to help her go to the bathroom and, you know, and things like that. So, you know, there that is. Um, but yeah, some people fight it to the very end and some people are good about it and, and recognize when they need to go in. It's usually not a narcissist. So, <laughs> um, the narcissists are the ones that are like, no, 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 no. I can do this. I can do this. I'm still young. I'm still this. I'm still that when they're, you know, 110 and they just can't take care of themselves anymore. Um, how can we go low to no contact when they start guilt trips and blame the, to the hubby? So, Again, that's when you get a good therapist, and that's when you start having your husband read all of these books. The Object of My Affection is in My Reflection, Coping with the Narcissist by Roquel Lerner, uh, the, the Stop Walking on Eggshells by Randy Krieger, both the book and the workbook, um, The Disease to Please by Harriet Breaker. Again, if there is fear, obligation, or guilt involved in any relationship, it is dysfunctional. I cannot say that enough. If there is fear, obligation, or guilt in any relationship, it is dysfunctional. It is not healthy. So um, you guys need to be on the same page. That's basically it. And, and you have to recognize that, okay, in some relationships, dysfunctional parent, right? So here's the dysfunction or the kid that came from the dysfunctional parent. They actually end up getting with somebody who's relatively healthy. Okay. So it's important to recognize that even though you don't have experience with maybe a narcissist or a disordered parent or whatever, and you recognize that this person that you love does, you need to get them rocking and rolling with a therapist and you need to get them rocking and rolling and yourself on all of these books so you understand what you're dealing with. So again, the art of war, if you know yourself, you have a 50% chance of winning. If you know yourself and the enemy, you have a 100% chance because you got it. You got the big picture. So it's really important to educate, 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 which is why I'm so thrilled that half the room was men this last time so I can start getting that message out because like I said, abusers can be female. Absolutely, some of the worst offenders I've seen have been female, so. All right, uh, my mother-in-law is always saying to my husband that she expects money from us when she retires. Sometimes I wonder if I'm being selfish by thinking that is just absurd since she doesn't really need it. Not absurd, not absurd at all, I mean, <laughs> that is something that definitely needs to be addressed with a therapist with your husband now before she retires. Absolutely. This, this, I see, I see a bad moon arising. <laughs> Let me just put it to you that way. This is going to cause problems because she's not kidding. So here's the deal. Things said in jest by a narcissist, by an abuser are always meant. Always. So you definitely want to nip that bad boy in the bud. So when my mom was at her worst, she was under the, the thrall of my dad and she said and did some pretty heinous things. And she kept telling all of us, you know, oh, you're, you're going to care for me when I get old. You're going to do this, you're going to do that. And we all basically banded together and said, mom, we love you. And no, <laughs> no, we're not doing that. No, because of the way you've behaved and we don't trust you and that's not going to happen. You know, so she tried pulling that back when dad was still alive. So, you know, and, and she did, she really did want to come live with one of us. But then when she got away from my dad, when my dad dropped dead, she was able to go, oh, oh, I've never been alone since I was ever, <laughs> you know, because she was like, she was raised by my narcissistic grandmother. She got married when she was 15. She had a baby when she was 18. She then married my dad when she was 26, and then she was with him for 45 years. So she never had a chance to figure out who the heck she is. So when she got rid of, you know, when her evil mom dropped dead and my dad dropped dead, she finally had the room 
and the space to start reading all the books that we've been shoving at her and saying, read this, read this, read this, read this, and work on herself. That's why I'm saying when you get out of an abusive relationship, you need alone time to work on yourself. Because if you don't, you're just going to go right back into another abusive relationship. And that's what my mom did. She went from an abusive mom to an abusive first husband to an abusive second husband. You know, and then finally, you know, in her 80s or 70s, she started finally reading and working and, and working on herself. So better late than never. Anyway, um, uh, the in-laws are blaming me for not wanting to be close with the entire family. So boundaries are huge. And as we all know, abusers do not like boundaries. They don't. You set up a boundary and they're going to test it like nobody's business. This is why I'm saying, if you are in a relationship and you've got a partner, you two need to be in therapy and you need to be on the same page. And it needs to be like rock solid. You guys are united front. Because let me tell you something, those abusive family members, those flying monkeys, those abusive in-laws, those abusive parents, they will try to find a way around, in, or through. And you cannot allow that. And that's why I'm saying, you've got to start working on yourself. Um, Oh, shoot. Uh, at age 18, two weeks after graduation, my narc parents said to quit being gay or move out. Oh, my God. Uh, after being out of their house for two months, they invited me to move back because they were concerned I was depressed. They continued their abuse until I went no contact at the age of 30. Yeah. <sighs> I cannot tell you how many narcissists are homophobes total homophobes. If their son or daughter is gay, they threaten to disown them. They threaten to harm them. They threaten to out them. They threaten to whatever. So if a parent does that, if you're, if you are LBGTQ and your parent is making noises that they're going to disown you, if, if you don't stop being gay, which is the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life, go no contact, just be done. Cause here's the deal guys. Here's the deal. If you were not related to any of these people, by marriage or otherwise, would you have anything to do with them? If the answer is no, act accordingly. So in some relationships, oh, hang on. Um, in some relationships, it, the, the, the abuser will target whoever sees them for the POS that they are. That's just what happens. And so in some relationships, what ends up happening, and it has to happen this way, is that the couple works on themselves, works on being a united front. If, the, if one part of the couple wants nothing to do with the narcissistic or an abusive in-law, they don't. They don't have them come over. They don't have them over for Christmas. They don't have anything to do with them. But the, other, but the son or the daughter of the abuser may choose to go back and visit. Now, here's where it gets sticky. This is where the non-abusive spouse or the non-abusive child, you know, the, the okay, <laughs> this gets all confusing. So this is the, the daughter-in-law or the son-in-law over here that's not related blood to this person. This is where they freak out because they know that this person is gonna be pulling all the gaslighting, all the rewriting of history, all of the dripping poison in the ear, all of the bullshit that they have done their entire life to this person. And so my suggestion is, is if that son or daughter feels called to go visit them, gut, not heart, not head, feels called to go visit them so that they can feel okay, then you limit the time. Limit the time. It takes about, depending on the abuse, between 24 and 72 hours before this person will go right back into the the age that they were when the the narcissist was doing their bullshit. So I would say no more than a two day visit, three at the most. Um, and you limit, you limit, you limit the time because the longer you are with an abuser, the longer you are around somebody who is manipulative, controlling, gaslighting, brainwashing, lying, intermittent positive rewards, the greater the chance you have of falling back into that behavior, that that target behavior, if that makes any sort of sense. So when, when spouses feel called to go visit, I always recommend keep it short. Keep it short and keep it infrequent. In other words, two, maybe three times a year. That's it. And you keep it for a long weekend or a weekend. That's it. And then as soon as you come back, get with your fucking therapist. 
because you're going to fucking need it because your brain is going to be all, it's going to be cognitive dissonance because this person's going to be filling your head full of shit. And then you're going to come back to reality and you're going to march into your spouse and you're going to pull a bunch of crap and your spouse is going to go, mm -mm, I don't think so. Let's try this again. Let's call our therapist. Let's go, you know, and then you're going to have to undo all of the crap that happened. So yeah, it's, it's, when I know somebody is under the fog because they're confused and they actually will say that. Oh my God, I feel so confused. Well, you're confused because your abuser is trying to brainwash you and they're filling your head full of crap that's not true and they're trying to say horrible things about your spouse who has been nothing but good to you, you know, because they want the power and the control and they want to break you two up and they really want you all to themselves so that you'll come take care of them and live with them forever or until they die, which most narcissists don't ever think they're going to die. So, um, so that's who is pulling your strings by Harriet Breaker. Yes. Thank you, Beth. Excellent book. Get it. Read it. Good book. Good companion book to the other one. Um, okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, so yeah, so they come back with cognitive dissonance if they are new to recovery. And if they do not have a solid base of dealing with the abusive parent, the toxic parent. So they will come back home and they will be, I'm so confused. I just feel confused. I just, you know, I, I don't understand. And they're angry because their parent is telling them one thing, but their spouse is telling them another. And it's the parent that's lying. So, you know, there that is. And that's what I'm saying. Get with a good therapist. Limit your time with them if you have to. Um, feels like there's no choice. Wishing things were different, different is a total waste of time. How do you accept? Okay, so it is what it is. It's kind of like AA. So it is what it is. This person is never going to change. They're not. The narcissists and leopards do not change their spots. They do not. They do not get better. Once they have reached malignancy and they are manipulating, controlling, brainwashing, gaslighting, intermittent positive rewards, sneering, lying, cheating, stealing, they don't change. Now, if a target of abuse has been around a narcissist and they picked up some of these behaviors. Once the narcissist is out of the picture, they can start working on it and they do change. But if the abuser is doing all the things that they're doing, they're never going to change. You have to accept that this person did not, has not, and will not ever have your best interest at heart. Ever. Ever. And that's hard to accept because that inner child in us is desperate to believe that they loved us and they did have our best interest at heart. So there's a couple of books that you need to work on. You need to work on the inner child. Oh, 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 oh. And there was a new one. Oh, by Susan Anderson that uh, Susan Bell recommended to me. It was called uh, Outer Child. Outer Child Work. So, um, so the inner child by Catherine Taylor, the outer child by Susan Anderson. Anderson, Susan Anderson. So, um, Outer Child Workbook. So, check out those two books. I think that's phenomenal. And then the Harriet Breaker books are phenomenal. So, this person's never going to change. Radical Acceptance by Tara Brock. It is what it is. You cannot change it. it it's kind of like the Buddhist uh, worry chart. You know, is there a problem? Yes. Can you do something about it? Yes. Then don't worry. Is there a problem? Yes. Can you do something about it? No. Then don't worry. That's acceptance. It is what it is. You know, you cannot change these people. You can only change you. That is it. You, you are the only person you have any sort of control over. That's it. You can't change them. You can't help them. You cannot fix them because you did not break them. And no matter how you twist yourself into a pretzel, you will never be good enough. You will never be whatever perfect picture they have in their heads for their son or daughter. That's just the way it is. Um, okay. Hang on a second. Uh, do, 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 do. Uh, they make us feel like they're, we're crazy. She says one thing and then she swears she never said it, that I'm crazy and that I've turned her son against her. Yes. This is called gaslighting. That's exactly what it is. They rewrite history. They, they deny, 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 deny. Uh, Cleopatra, queen of denial. Um, they do all sorts of um, twisted turns to, um, uh, to, to deny what they're doing. So for example, like I said, when the mother-in-law cornered the daughter-in-law in the kitchen and started screaming at her, right? And then the daughter-in-law goes to the son and says, what the fuck? And then, of course, the son goes, that never happened. Mom said she didn't do that. Why are you lying? What? 
holy shit, Houston, we got a huge ass problem. So that's what they do. Don't expect them to behave any differently than they behaved. I, have I told you guys the story about the, the, the toad and the, and the scorpion? I'm sure I have. So the toad and the scorpion, on one side of a river is a toad and a scorpion. And the scorpion comes up to the toad and says, hey, Mr. Toad, would you give me a ride across the river? And the toad goes, are you kidding me? We're going to get out in the middle of the river and you're going to sting me and we're going to drown. And the scorpion goes, Mr. Toad, think about it. I would not do that because if I did that, we would both die. And so the toad thinks about it for a little bit and, uh, okay. And so the scorpion climbs up on his back. And so Mr. Toad starts swimming out into the river. He gets about halfway out. And lo and behold, the scorpion stings him. And as they're drowning, as they're going down, both of them, the toad looks at him with these wide eyes and goes, but why, Mr. To Mr. Scorpion, why, why? We're both going to die now. Why would you do this? And the scorpion looks at him and says, it's in my nature. This is who they are. They will not change. This is what they do. They will not change. Even when you point it out to them, it's, you're wasting your breath. You might as well, you'd be having a better conversation with my backdrop here and probably more understanding and probably a deeper conversation. So seriously, because they don't change. This is their nature. This is who they are. They have shown you who they are. Believe them the first time. When somebody treats you like shit, believe them the first time. Believe them the first time. When somebody rages at you, believe them the first time. When somebody accuses you of stuff that's not true, believe them the first time. They have shown you who they are. Be done. Be done being abused. So when you have that situation doing that, where they're cornering you and saying and doing one thing and then going to the, the son or the daughter-in-law or the son or the daughter and saying, no, that never happened. Houston, you got a huge problem. you got to get your, your spouse into uh, a therapist uber fast that works on this kind of abuse and you gotta, you got to get her done because otherwise your relationship is going to go to crap. Okay. Um, all right. Doot, doot, doot. And I've got questions I've got to get to that I haven't had a chance. Ah! Okay. Um, how can we get back to hope and self-love when we feel the most extremely hopeless, when we have been parentified and can't remember that we ourselves are important when the constant parental emergency kept us from feeling hope or excitement? So, oh, boy. so, okay. In regards to a toxic parent or a toxic in-law, they will try to keep us from doing what we love. They do. They sabotage. They sabotage like nobody's business. So you get back to self-love by working on yourself and learning to say no. Not everything is an emergency. I know that to the narcissist, everything is an emergency and it has to always be about them. But the truth of the matter is you can say no. Will there be consequences? Will the narcissist come unglued? Will they do the cold shoulder? Will they do the, uh, you know, not talking to you for a month or two or 10? Yeah, they will. And, <laughs> you know, your well-being is, is worth it. It is. So you learn to have boundaries. You learn to love yourself with self-esteem. The Self-Esteem Workbook by Sheraldi. You get back to the things you love. So when we come out of an abusive relationship, whether it's with a toxic family, you know, mom and dad are toxic, or with its, whether it's with a toxic romantic partner, we have to figure out who we are. What is important to us? What are our boundaries? And what are our deal breakers? This is the thing, is that we allow parents to treat us way worse than we should. Why? Because we've got the whole societal thing about honor thy mother and father, which is a load of crap because the very next line says, parents do not bring your children to anger. It's a two-way fucking street, even in the Bible. So they do that bullshit. And we've got, <laughs> somebody mentioned that a therapist told them that they had to reconcile with uh, a dad that had beat them, strangled them, you know, threatened them, et cetera. No, you don't. You don't. You absolutely not. Do not reconcile with somebody who has done that to you. That's bullshit. And that therapist, quite frankly, needs to be turned into the board. Seriously, because that's dangerous shit. Telling your client that's been beaten, strangled, almost killed to reconcile with that piece of shit? Are you fucking kidding me? What the, where the fuck did you get your degree? 
So yeah, I get a little pissed off about that. That's why I'm saying get with a good therapist, somebody who is going to be on your side, who is going to be advocating for you, who is going to be the voice of reason, who is going to be like, fuck no, you're not, no, no. If you were not related to this person, would you have anything to do with no? With a side of no and an extra helping of fuck no. Ugh, sorry. So yeah, I mean, you do not, we do not fucking negotiate with terrorists. I don't care who the fucking terrorist is. I don't care if it's your fucking mother-in-law. I don't care if it's your fucking father-in-law. I don't care if it's your fucking grandmother. I don't care if it's your fucking father. I don't care if it's your fucking mother. We do not fucking negotiate with fucking asshole terrorists, period. Fuck the fuck out of fuck me, fuck them. Seriously, you owe them nothing. You owe them nothing. Say it with me. You owe them nothing. Nothing. If there is fear, obligation, or guilt, uh-uh. Nope. You owe them nothing. Which brings me to the next question that I promised I would hit. So, okay. So what happens when we've got a toxic mom or dad and the other parent was not toxic, but they did not protect us? What do we do? What do we do? Okay, so you're gonna have a lot of mixed emotions on this, okay? So when we are growing up in a, an abusive family, okay, Generally, what ends up happening is there's an abuser and then there's an enabler, okay? And that's usually the spouse, all right? Because they allow, again, the abuser to do all of their bullshit and sometimes they go along with whatever has been happening in the relationship. You know, they'll, let's say the abuser says, um, you know, you need to beat the kids, you need to do this, you need to do that. Well, because this person is under Stockholm Syndrome, they will go along with the abuser says in order to appease the abuser in order to stay safe in the relationship what does that do to the kids well that fucks them up pretty royally because the kids are going to have mixed emotions because if the other person is pretty much for the most part a good parent kind gentle listening etc but they continue to allow this person to beat them harm them hurt them or occasionally they enjoy an in in it then the kids are going to have hugely mixed emotions and if that parent dies the one that was you know kind of going along with enabling etc you're going to have complicated grief like nobody's fucking business because you're going to have that love hate love hate love hate guilt wow. so it's hard for kids that have grown up with a parent that they love but that didn't protect them it's hard for the kids. It's horrific for the kids. And I can see, this is where it gets really trippy for me because it's like, I can understand the enabler because they're terrified and they're living under the threat of a narcissist who's gonna beat them, harm them, you know, do whatever. But then they didn't protect the kids. So they're just kind of as guilty as the abuser is, but, the kids also love the enabler, so there's all of these mixed, conflicting emotions. This is normal for children that have been raised in this kind of environment. And the way to work through it is you honor both sides of the equation. You are going to love that person. You are also going to hate that person. You're going to have anger at that person. You're going to have understanding for that person. And it's, it's, it's an and world, guys. It's an and world. It's not going to be black or white. It's not going to be this or that. It is going to be and. I hate them and I love them. I understand why they did and I have no fucking clue why they did it. And it's going to be all of it. It's going to be all of the emotions all at once. And the best suggestion I can give to you on that is to get with a really goddamn good therapist and start working through it. I suggest journaling like nobody's fucking business. Like really, like write and burn letters. Now listen to me now, believe me later. You are never, ever, 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 ever going to send these letters. None of these letters are for any of these other people. Everything that you write is for you and you alone, your eyes, your eyes alone. Unless you choose to, to share it with your therapist, you know, or best friend or somebody you trust, but you are not gonna share it with the person it's addressed to, okay? So when we've got a complicated relationship like that and we've got a lot of anger and we have a lot of resentment and justifiably so, you write it out. You get it out of your head, you get it 
onto paper, you trot it out to the barbecue, you read it through once, you light it on fire. Or conversely, which somebody in Atlanta suggested, which I really liked, is if you really feel that need to feel that need to send it, you send it to yourself or you address it to your therapist and you pop it in the mail. And then when it gets to your therapist, we can go through it. That would be great. And then we can burn it because I have a little chimney at office and I do that. So I don't mean send me your letters, but you know, your therapist, you know, your therapist should be able to work you through these letters. So you write it out. You're gonna feel conflicted. You are. And, and totally normal. Totally normal. It is totally normal to feel anger and and love and hatred and understanding and all of the plethora of emotions that go with that because there was something good about that particular parent they just didn't protect you and they should have they should have they absolutely should have but they didn't and that's the other thing it's like going no contact is the target's choice if at some point later on you choose to have contact with that parent that did not protect you that's your choice and and there is the possibility that once they get away from the abuser they may have enough space that they can start working through what they did you know like I said like with my mom once her abusers were all dead and she was alone and she worked on herself we had many deep conversations about you didn't protect me you didn't do this you didn't do that why did you do this why did you do that why did how did this happen what did it and she was willing to talk about it now not every parent is going to be like that not every single parent is going to be like that i'm going to tell you right now it's not going to be all sunshine and roses and unicorn farts it's not you know some parents are dis disordered themselves you know some parents their ego is so fragile that they cannot accept responsibility for what they have done their guilt is huge and they don't want to deal with it but that doesn't excuse it that does not excuse it I mean you can still bring it up to them if you so choose but don't expect a Walt Disney ending is what I'm trying to say so um, write it out write it out get it out of your head get it on to paper and validate what you are feeling validate what you are feeling because everything you are feeling is hundred and ten percent normal for having had an abusive parent with an enabling parent that didn't protect us this is normal. All of the emotions are normal. Okay, I hope that answered that question. Um, it was a catch-22 with my mom, was angry, livid about any discussion about assisted living, but also couldn't accept help, yeah. And also complained that I didn't do X, Y, and Z to help her. Crazy making, so glad she's safe in assisted living now. I'm a huge fan of assisted living, I really am. Especially if a parent or a uh, in-law is damaging and is trying their darndest to rip your marriage apart, yeah, absolutely. Is enmeshment a separate problem from narcissistic histrionic parent or do all of those problems go hand in hand? All of those problems go hand in hand. Here's why. Narcissists, abusers, whether they are narcissistic, malignant, or whether they are borderline malignant, they do not recognize and or validate boundaries at all. They do not have a sense of where they end and another person begins. So to them, oh, this is, this is, oof, okay. Narcissists specifically do not view living beings as living beings. Wrap your head around that for a second. They view us as objects to be used. No different than this phone. No different than this phone. They do not view us as having any purpose other than to supply them with their narcissistic need. So we are objects to be used. Pets are objects to be used. People are objects to be used. Uh, anybody, anything, birds, whatever. It, they do not see us as humans with our own wants, our own needs, our own desires, our own thoughts. Everything must be, and this goes specifically for the malignant borderlines, everything must be their thought, their want, their need, their desire. It has to be all about them and with the narcissist too. But with the thoughts, it's mostly the, the borderlines do that. But with the narcissist, everything has to be about them. This is why they ruin birthdays. This is why they ruin vacations. This is why they ruin uh, holidays. This is why they, they, anything that's not about them, they come unglued. They come unglued. 
So that is that. Comparing you to another child. Competition. So this is what dysfunctional families will do, is they will set up the kids to be in competition with each other. And it's a divide and conquer move is what this is. So what they do is they want the kids to not get along. They want the kids to not be talking to each other in a healthy way. They want the kids to be jealous of each other. So what will end up happening, and, and I believe I talked with, um, oh gosh, I can't think of her name now, um, but I was talking with her yesterday about um, in families, they will tell each child that they're the golden child, but then they'll separately tell other kids, you know, other stories. So, you know, or they'll, or they'll say, you know, you're the scapegoat, but then they'll go to the golden child and say, oh no, that's the golden child. I mean, it's a mind fuck. This is what they do. And it's in order to maintain control. And so what they hope is that the kids never get together and never start comparing notes and never start talking and never become a united front against the crazy parents. So that's why they do that, is because if the kids did, the crazy parent would lose control. The crazy parent wouldn't be able to manipulate and emotionally degradate and harm anybody because everybody knows the game now. So the problem it is, the narcissist has the rule book and everybody else is trying to play catch up, if that makes any sort of sense. Um, my husband forgets or says he didn't hear every jab his mom takes at him. It really confuses me. Okay, so that's cognitive dissonance. And what that is, it's a protection mechanism. It's an ego protection mechanism. And it's the little kid inside not wanting the mom to be as harmful as she really is. And it's, it's denial. It's denial. It's denial. Cleopatra, queen of denial. It's all about, no, no, she can't be that bad. No, 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 this is my mom. Mom, moms are supposed to be nice and kind and helpful and supportive and this, that, and the other thing. But unfortunately, with an abusive parent, they're not. They're mean. They're harmful. They lie. They jab. They snark. They, you know, all of that stuff. They're vindictive. They're, they're evil, horrible, awful, terrible people. And um, that's why your husband's doing that. It's because it's denial and it's cognitive dissonance. And he's having to cope with the idea that mom and dad did not have his best interest at heart. I remember when I realized that my mom and dad did not have my best interest at heart. And it was heartbreaking. It was. Because it's like you so desperately want that, you know, couple to have your best interest at heart. And yet they don't. So you have to really come to grips with that. And it is, it is really hard. Uh, my husband was blamed for his brother's divorce by the in-laws. Oh, mm. okay. So um, blame and shame are things that uh, abusers do. And, and we get blamed. The, the identified uh, scapegoat gets blamed for everything, even though you had nothing to do with it. And especially if they see the abusers for what they are, yeah, they're going to go out of their way to make you responsible for everything that is wrong in the world. And you just have nothing to do with them. Gray rock, get out. Um, all right. All right. Thank you, Laura. Have a great day. Um, okay. Uh, oh yeah. So sabotage, they sabotage like nobody's business. Um, okay. So, okay. So with the honor thy mother and father thing, like I said, the very next line is parents do not bring your children to anger. It's a two way street. It absolutely is. And you have a right to have your own space. You have a right to not be abused. You have a right to say no. You have a right to not deal with somebody who is actively trying to harm you or your relationship. Absolutely. Um, it makes you wonder why the verse never seems to require them to do anything honorable. Hmm. Uh, okay. Yes, it does. Uh, my husband was a little overworked and decided to vent to his parent about how hard his work was. His mom told him to find an easier job. He's an engineer like his dad and his brother and the golden child. Uh, maybe engineering was too hard for him. I was livid. And my husband said he didn't remember. She said that. I just can't understand. Again, doesn't have the best interest. And that's why. So, yeah. Therapy, 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 therapy would be a really good idea. Couples therapy addressing this because this is affecting you guys. It's affecting your relationship. It's affecting what's going on. So yeah, absolutely. And if you can go gray rock and, and or limited contact, that would be the best. Um, yeah, they project like crazy. Absolutely. Yeah, don't return to the madness. It's, it's like that Taylor Swift song. We are never, ever, ever 
getting back together again. And that goes for toxic families. Once they've shown you who they are, get the hell out. Um, you owe them nothing. Um, reconciliation is impossible, guys. It's, it's really impossible. You just, if you have to be around them, you gray rock and you protect yourself. That's the best you can do. Okay. All right. Um, yes, abusers love to twist the Bible, the Quran, the Torah, any religious text. They will absolutely take it out of context. You betcha. Um, okay, let's see. Sorry, guys, I've been trying to catch up on all this stuff. Uh, um, he was so afraid. Okay, this is my dad. So talking about the enmeshed uh, enabler. This was my dad going against my mom. He never even talk to us. He went through her for everything he wanted to tell us or ask even after we were all grown up and they were divorced. Yeah, they're, they're terrified of their abusers. So remember, when we have been abused and we don't work on it, like really work on it. This is why I'm saying once you get out of an abusive relationship, whether that's with a toxic family or whether it's in a toxic romantic relationship or whatever, stay single for at least a year and a day. Why? Because you need to address whatever this is. You need to get this handled. If you do not, you will find yourself in one shitty relationship after another shitty relationship after another shitty relationship after another shitty relationship. Because you're trying to fix this original wound over here, you know, or, or here, here's the original wound. And you're trying to find somebody that reminds you of the original wound. And so you just keep making shit sandwiches. Stop it. Stop it. The only way you're going to fix this is by confronting it head on, working through it with a therapist, getting all of the workbooks that I talk about, the CPTSD from Surviving to Thriving by Pete Walker, Harriet Brager books, Raquel Lerner books, uh, Catherine Taylor, The Inner Child, Susan Anderson, The Outer Child, working through this, really getting this nailed down and having a list of deal breakers. What will you not put up with from anybody? And I don't care who the fuck they think they are. I love it when somebody's a mom or a dad and they think that they can absolutely say and do whatever. No, you may not, period. It's, if you're not going to be respectful, get out of my life. You know, simple as that. Um, so it, it's working on yourself. You have to work on yourself. And if you do not work on yourself, you will find yourself right back in the same situation over and over and over again. And you're going to be standing there going, I don't understand. How come I'm in the same situation? Well, it's because you never addressed the original wound work on this. You work on this, you're good to go. And you get your deal breakers, you're good to go. Okay. Um, all right. Yes, I struggled with my dad's actions. Early in life, he supported and protected me. Later, he started siding against me with my mother. Yeah, that's absolutely. That's what they do. They side with whoever is the abuser. Um, Yay, letters, write letters, guys, write letters, write letters, and burn them, burn them, burn them, burn them, or mail them to your, your counselor, or mail them to yourself, and then burn them, don't even open them up, just pop them in the barbecue and burn them, okay, uh, okay, hang on, sorry, trying to run through the question, can you please talk about narc in-laws as grandparents and going low contact, oh, let's talk about that right now, because I can go for another hour, I hope. As long as my voice holds out, I'll keep going. All right, so narcissistic grandparents. <sighs> Boy, so here's the deal. If they were mean to you when you were a kid, they're gonna be mean to your kids too, okay? Don't be around them. So they, you want to go no contact, low contact. And if you're going to have your kids around them, have it supervised. Have it supervised. There's no reason to allow your children around somebody like that unsupervised. Because I can guarantee you the narcissistic grandparents are going to say and do whatever it is they did to you. And they're going to try to undo the relationship that you have with your kid. I can guarantee it. You can take that to the bank and earn interest on it. So what you're going to do is you're always going to be supervised. There are not going to be any unsupervised visits with these grandparents. And if you can, you're always busy. You're always busy. Nope, sorry, can't come over this weekend. Nope, sorry, got a birthday party. Nope, sorry, got schoolwork. Nope, sorry. You don't. You just don't. You owe them nothing. Because like I said, if you know they are narcissists, if you know they are abusive, they're gonna pull the same shit with your little ones. So 
why do that to yourself and to them? Don't do it. Just go no contact, always be busy. And of course, they're going to guilt trip. They are. You never come, you never write, you never call. Why don't you ever call or write? Maybe it's because you're a narcissist. I don't know. You know, I mean, you, you just come up with some excuse. It's like, I'm sorry, I'm really busy. You know, I've got things to do. If you feel the need to go low contact, limit your visits an hour at the most. Okay, got to go, kids. We got we to gotta swim lesson or whatever. But you are under no obligation to narcissistic grandparents. Now, the other thing I wanted to talk about is narcissistic grandparents will go so far as to try to pull the grandparent rights. So in the state of Arizona, um, if you are single or have been divorced for three months, narcissistic grandparents can try to march in and demand visitation. But they have to prove a whole lot of stuff. And if you don't want them around them, you have to prove a whole lot of stuff, as in why. So just be aware that that stuff happens and narcissists will try to use the court system to their advantage in any way they can. So if there is stuff going on with a narcissistic grandparent, you document it. You document, document, document. This is why I don't want them around my children. And as the parent, I have the right to say that, you know, and, and honestly, the courts are very loath to give, at least here in Arizona, uh, grandparent visitation rights, unless, unless, caveat, the parents are having absolute problems and the grandparents are trying to get, you know, custody of the kids because the grandparents are actually pretty okay people and the kids need someplace stable. But that's a completely different situation. That is not a narcissistic grandparent. So, okay. So, Narcan laws as grandparents, again, same thing. You limit the time. You limit the time and you have supervised visits. You have supervised visits. If you recognize that they're damaging and harmful to your spouse, you don't want them around your kids and you have supervised visits. Is that a pain in your ass? Because now you're having to, you know, take time that would normally be like, you know, hey, go over to grandma's house. I get to have some alone time, you know, do, yeah, but it's to protect the kids. So yeah, you, you just be busy, always, always busy and supervised visits. You're just always there. Oh no, it's okay. I can hang out. No big deal. You know, and always be there because trust me, they will try to talk trash to your kids about you because that's what they do. That is in their nature. They are the scorpion. Okay. Um, my mom won't admit to anything. She has toxic amnesia, said it didn't happen. Yes, that is very common in uh, elderly <laughs> abusive parents because they abuse amnesia. So remember how I talked about abuse amnesia has two forms. It's, it's when we minimalize Oh, that didn't happen. Oh, it wasn't as bad. Oh, da 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 da. That's minimalization. That's abuse amnesia. We're forgetting how horrible it was. And then there is the abusers who intentionally don't remember what they said or did to cause harm. So, yeah, they absolutely do that. That's a way to get themselves off the hook. Absolutely. That never happened. I don't remember that. I, that, da, 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 da. yeah, bullshit. It's another way also to make you feel off balance so that you don't remember or you don't trust your own gut. Trust your gut. Trust your gut. Here's the big thing. We cannot trust our head. We cannot trust our heart. These two will do story and they will go blah, 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 and drive us crazy. The gut is a simple yes or no. Did this happen? Yes. Okay. There it is. Trust it. Trust that. That is going to steer you right every single time. It will never steer you wrong. This will steer you wrong. This will steer you wrong. Yes or no question to the gut never steers you wrong. Listen to the gut. Okay. Um, yeah, they flip the script, Joe. They flip the script and they just, they blame everything on the target. Absolutely. Um, it's so hard to accept that they did not love us because we want to believe we're lovable. And the truth of the matter is we are. But that inner child in us is having a hard time reconciling that this person that was supposed to love us did not. And it's not our fault. So that's why I'm saying get with a really, really good therapist to help you work on acceptance that it wasn't you. It's not you. It's them. A healthy, normal mom or dad does not instill fear, does not instill obligation, and does not instill guilt. And they don't try to manipulate and control. And they don't sabotage. And they don't manipulate. And they don't fucking lie. And let's just keep going, <laughs> you know? So it, it's hard for us to reconcile that because we desperately want to believe that they loved us or love us and have our best interest at heart, and they don't. 
when somebody abuses, they do not have our best interest in heart. They don't. And it's hard for us to accept because we're struggling with that inner child. So that's why I'm saying get the inner child workbook by Catherine Taylor. Get the outer child workbook by Susan Anderson, I think is the name of that one. Okay. Uh, my dad was the enabler. He's now over 80. His position is that it was always my fault that she treated me the way she did. This sits with this sits me all kinds of sideways. Yes, clearly he is not in a place of truth. Yeah, absolutely. Good, good recognizing that. I don't see any point in saying anything to him. Am I right? Can, I can only change me, right? Yeah, absolutely. So you know the truth. You know the truth. Your gut knows the truth, you know, and your tribe knows the truth. So you trust your gut. Trust your gut. Write it out. Burn it let it go. You cannot change him. You know, he's not willing to see that that's not how a normal mom or dad reacts. So write it out, let it go. You can, you can have compassion from him and you can have compassion for him and you can have compassion for him from afar. You don't necessarily need to be around him. Uh, okay. I thought I was really close to my mom, but now I think it was enmeshment and maybe trauma bonding Stockholm syndrome. Yes. And that's where it gets confusing because trauma bonding and Stockholm syndrome, we, do get very enmeshed with the abuser because we think our survival depends on them and they take over every part of our life. So when we start healing, we have to separate out what is them and what is us. What is their issue? What is our issue? And that's why it's really helpful to start working on self-esteem. That's why it's really helpful to start working on boundaries. That's why it's really helpful to get with a really good therapist and help reinforce all of the positive stuff, the mirror work, all of that. So, yeah. Uh, yep. Teaching boundaries is huge. Uh, my mom told me I was the only, the only reason she had me so I could take care of her in her older days. Oh, God. She's not kidding. Um, so, consider that. Uh, and that's not a good reason to have a child. You have a child because you want to be a parent and you are called to be a parent. And you love kids, not so that you can have somebody take care of you in your old age or so that you can trap somebody with you for the next 18 years. You don't do that. Uh, why does the abused son or daughter sometimes just forgets or can't acknowledge when the abuser takes a swing at them? Cognitive dissonance, inability to accept what is. So that's why therapy is recommended and needed to help work through this. And if they can't, if they can't see that the, their parent is abusive and harmful, you may want to reconsider the relationship because it's only going to get worse as the parent ages. So because the demands are going to become greater and greater and greater and greater on that particular child, unless that child puts the smack down and goes, nope, not playing, not buying this stuff, not playing your game. Have a nice day. So, uh, okay. Uh, all right. Yeah, they ruin weddings, they ruin barbecues, they were ruin parties, everything, you betcha. Okay. Um, triangulation, yes, they will invent stuff and they will create outrage with the other sibling, trying to break you guys apart. That is, that is what abusers do. Okay. Yeah, okay, so narcissists, again, view children as objects. They are only as good as how they can make the narcissist look. So they will brag about the accomplishments. Lori, I'm talking about your question that you, you uh, uh, put in. Uh, they will brag about your accomplishments, but do nothing to help you. So like you said, you know, you're the one that did all the, the college and all of this and you got it on your own. And yet they're sitting there going, look at my daughter, look how fabulous they are, look how, you know, this, that, and the other thing they are, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, absolutely. And somebody just sent in and said, the devil wears Prada is a good example of uh, no contact with a narcissist. The devil wears Prada. Um, so I, I haven't seen that one. I need to watch it. Um, okay. Um, all right. And the second we don't make them look good, again, now we're on the outs and written out of the will or whatever and, you know, not bragged about, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, the minute my golden child brother got married, my sister-in-law became the scapegoat. I was always the scapegoat in the family. Yeah, it'll, it'll, it'll change to whoever the new, new person is, you bet. Uh, okay, let's see. 
My burning question is to you is to how to explain or tell the story in a professional way when you come from disordered family members, then married, divorced, likewise. How do you explain to a panel type in a potential occupation where they may interview family members or ex-in-laws? Vindictive types is a background about you. I've never heard of that. Wow. If any of you guys have heard of that, help Michelle out. Uh, I'm not quite sure how to answer that question because, wow. So if they're looking for character references, I would only give character references to family members that you trust, you know, or friends that you trust. Um, if you're having to explain to them that, wow, I'm not really sure how to do that. I mean, it could be something along the lines of, um, my family and I are no contact. Uh, it's it's not a good situation. Um, you know, if you care to know more, you could read Raquel Lerner's Learning to Cope with a Narcissist, you know, that kind of thing. Um, that, that's really how I would deal with it. And honestly, to me, it's like, why are they doing this? What kind of, what kind of job are you going into that they need to have family members and stuff? So... I don't know. I would I would just keep it as, as short and to the point as possible. My family and I are no contact. Uh, my ex and I are no contact. If you want more information on that, object of my affection is in my reflection, coping with a narcissist by Raquel Luna. That's what I would do. So I don't know if that answers it or not. Guys out there, if that can if you can help Michelle with that one, send her a answer to that. Because honestly, Michelle, I'm not sure. I'm not I personally would not be in a position where that would happen. I wouldn't because I would just be point blank. It's like, look, my family's no contact. I'm no contact with my ex. If you want to know more, read this book. That's all I'm going to say about it. Period. You know, so. All right. Um, so my, my little girl's nine and she misses her grandparents who are always nice to her. Uh, she hasn't seen them in three years now. Well, you, you know, you just explain it the best you can, which is what you did. And you just, you know, I hate to say it, but you find substitutes. You find, you find your tribe. You find a new family. You find people, friends, maybe parents of friends that can be kind of like substitute grandparents. That's what you do. I mean, it's just, it's just what you do. If you cannot have them around them, then you make sure that there is some sort of substitute. And you use family members, friends, parents, et cetera, if they're healthy. If they're not healthy, obviously not. But you explain it to them the best you can. And it's just kind of like, again, you're not wanting to smear. You're not wanting to uh, give too much information because nine is pretty young. But it's just kind of like, you know, being around my mom and dad for me is not healthy. So we're just not going to do that. But why? But why? When you're older, I'll explain. And you leave it at that. Okay. Um... Okay, I believe my mother-in-law is a narcissist, but she tells everyone that I am. She's flipped the script. And it's making me question whether or not I am one, the, cause, the one causing all the problems with her or her. Uh, if maybe I may be an actual narcissist, if that makes any sense, how can I tell if it's me or her? <laughs> okay, if you're questioning, probably not you. Okay, um, so here's the deal. Narcissists flip the script. This is what they do. So what they'll do is they'll run around and say, the person who sees them for what they really are is the narcissist. They're the narcissist. They're, they're telling you that I'm the narcissist, but they're the narcissist, da, da, da. So here's the deal. Actions. Actions speak louder than words. What are the actions? Who is the one that is being truthful? Who is the one that is being kind? Who is the one who's got good boundaries? Who is the one who is healing? Who is the one that's healing the family? Who is the one that is being encouraging? Who is the one that does not smear? Who is the one who, um, you know, has integrity? That's what you look to. So, you know, if, if you're the one with all of those qualities, then you're not the narcissist. <laughs> so, but that's what they do. They flip the script and they try to make us think that we're the bad person because we're taking their son or daughter away from them, yada, yada, yada. And, um, you know, know yourself. Know yourself, you know. And a narcissist has a set group of behaviors that 
they present with no matter where in the world they are. And they cannot help but lie. They cannot help but smear. They cannot help but be negative. They cannot help but be unkind. They cannot help but, you know, do all of these behaviors. If your, your mom-in-law is doing all of that, then guess what? So there you go. Don't worry about it. Take a look at the behaviors. What are the behaviors doing? If you're not lying, if you're not smearing, if you're not causing drama, if you're not, you know, and she is, then there's your answer. Okay. All right. No shit sandwiches, not even with fries. I agree. Um, okay. Yeah, they do not see us as adults or worthy parents. Absolutely. Absolutely. They, they refuse to allow us to be competent. Absolutely. Um, yeah, Joe, it, it, there's physical abuse involved. Do not allow them around. Absolutely. Do not allow them around. Okay. Uh, do, 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 do. Hang on. Okay, hang on. Yeah, don't leave them alone with the kids ever, not even for five minutes. Shannon made a good point that it only took five minutes for them to grab the kid and start doing bullshit. So don't don't leave them alone with the, the narcissistic grandparents ever. Uh, my, my parents were terrible grandparents. My children do not like them. They played manipulative, demeaning games on my children when they were left alone with the ch my children. My mother locked my nieces in the basement. She locked us out of the house. Holy cow. Yeah, if, you're, if your parents were treating you horribly and did things like that, like locking you out of the house or locking you in the basement or things like that, they're going to do it to your kids too. They're, they're, they're not going to suddenly, it's not like they're going to wake up and go, Oh, I, can, I should have had a V8. I'm going to be a nice, good parent now. No, it's not going to happen, guys. They don't change. They just don't change. Um, okay, hang on a second. Boy, lots. this really touched a nerve. I cannot tell you how many questions. Hang on, I'm going to flip over to this page and see if I've got all of the ones I wanted to hit on. Um, okay, my husband was the scapegoat. The parents were communal and covert narc traits. Tons of trauma for him. They all have covert abusive behavior. How do I keep up low minimum contact and possibly go no contact? They are poking me, smearing me, blaming me for all the family issues. Uh, okay, so, and the mother-in-law is texting me examples of why I should be texting her daily about what they are eating, where they are going, et cetera, et cetera. You know, control, control, control. Uh, okay, so here's... The deal, again, as with anything else that I've talked about today, get with a good therapist. You've got to get your husband on board. You've got to lay down the law and draw boundaries and read The Disease to Please by Harriet Breaker and the other one by Harriet Breaker who's pulling your strings and not text this woman. She, you don't owe her anything. You're not a child. You don't need to show her what you guys are eating every day and where you're going and what you're doing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You have the right to say no. And your husband has to be on board with that. And I would strongly suggest starting to go lower and lower and lower contact until it's no contact. And get with a good therapist. Get with a good therapist. Make sure your husband is going and make sure he's on the same page. And because the mom's going to try to guilt trip. She's going to try to brainwash. She's going to try to do everything else. So, whoo, damn, there are some really sketchy parents out there, let me tell you. Um, Okay. How do I tell my father we're expecting? I don't want to do it, but it seems like a thing I need to do. If you are no contact with them, you don't. If you are in contact with them, you can. Um, but you make sure that the boundaries are up and the expectations are up. If your parent is the type of parent that's going to march in and try to be there and take over, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, then you just don't. And frankly, I, I recommend that people, honestly, don't tell anybody about the pregnancy until you're past the first trimester. Um, because really that first trimester, that's when a lot of the miscarriages happen and you don't want to tell everybody and then have to tell everybody you lost the baby if that happens. The other thing of it is too, is that I have seen narcissistic people try to induce a miscarriage in somebody 
in that first trimester by all sorts of things, feeding them raw fish, uh, you know, giving them stuff that would, you know, upset them or whatever. So they're, they're horrible, awful, terrible people. So you really don't want to tell them anything if you can get away with it. Um, and you want to wait until after that first, that first trimester before you, you let a lot of people know. If you are no contact with the dad, stay no contact, you know, and um, just, yeah, it, it, what is your motivation? What are you hoping to get from this? Why do you feel the need to tell him? If this is somebody you've been no contact with, what are you thinking is going to happen? There might be some expectations there on your part that are unrealistic. So again, get with a good therapist, work it through, figure out why. Why do you want to tell them? If, if they were abusive, why are you wanting to tell them? So that's a good question to ask. Um, the in-laws do bombardment whenever they see us. Yep, they do that. Uh, I'm afraid if something happens to me, no one will be there to help me. That's why I talk to them. I pay these this price for security. So here's the thing. Security's not worth it. Security's not worth it and they've lied to you. They've made you feel like you are incompetent and you cannot take care of yourself. You can, absolutely. And once you clear out all of the toxic family members and all of the toxic friends, you make room for the people who really will be there for you with no strings attached that have unconditional love for you. So work on your self-esteem. Get rid of that idea that you need somebody like a toxic family member or you know mom and dad to be there because really, they won't. They say they will, but then there's all sorts of strings attached and that's, that's not a real relationship. So yeah, it's not worth any price. It's, it's not worth security. That's not security, that's the illusion of security. It really is, because the reality is they'll turn on you the second they can. So there that is. Um, how to remind ourselves that the ex-partner was, yes, truly an arc and wasn't just being triggered by his controlling mother. He triangulated me with her nasty comments about me, but he used it as an excuse to the abuse. There's a danger in excusing a real abusive person as fleas. Well, so again, the way you tell the difference is that once it has been brought to their attention, they actually start working on the behavior. So it's, it's not fleas if it's been brought to their attention and they continue the behavior and they don't go get help and they don't work on themselves and they don't read any of the stuff. It is fleas if, they, if it is brought to their attention and they go, oh shit, this sucks. I don't wanna be like my mom, my dad. I'm gonna go get a therapist. I'm gonna start working these workbooks until I can get into a therapist. And then you see actual change. That's how you tell the difference. Actions, guys. Actions, actions, actions. I, I posted a thing by Jay Jetty, I think is his name. Love him. And he said, what is real love? Well, real love is service. Real love is actions. That's how you tell what real love is. Fake love is lip service. Fake love is, oh, love you, oh, love you, oh, love you, but oh, gee, I'm going to keep stabbing you in the back. That's not love. So real love is the actions. What act of service goes along with the saying that you love the person? Are, you, are your words and your actions united? Do they, do they match? If they don't, that's not love. So there you go. Um, yeah, love is easy to say, but it's not easy to do. Do the words and the actions match? That's what you want to look for. Okay. Oh, Catherine, good for you. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Oh, yeah. Okay, so the, the stereotypical thing that abusers say is that children are to be seen and not heard. So that's not true. Children very much need to be heard. They do. And um, it's important to listen to what kids say. It absolutely is. And the, what... <laughs> One of the hallmarks of an abusive parent is when the child is being abused by a stepdad or a dad or a stepmom or a mom, and the child tells, and then the parent says that they're lying. So that's not listening to your kid. So, um, and I see that a lot with you know abusive step parents, abusive step grandparents, or abusive grandparents, or abusive parents, or whatever. Is the kid finally tells the truth about their abuse, and then the other parent says, "Oh no, you're lying." So. <laughs> There are a lot of screwed up parents out there that are more interested in being in a romantic relationship than they are in protecting their own children. And that's going to affect the kids later on. Absolutely. That's going to lead to that love hate kind of thing, that enmeshment that we talked about earlier. They're going to want to, at some point, maybe confront them. So yeah, it's, it's a thing. It's a thing. And it, it sucks for the kids all the way around. 
all the way. There is no winning in this one for the kids because the kids are victimized over and over and over again, once by the abuser, then by the parent that doesn't protect them, then by whoever doesn't listen to them, and then by the judicial system. So it, it sucks. It just sucks. I do. Mm. Okay. All right. Good. Teach your kids the mirror work. That's the best thing you can do. That's self-esteem. Teach your kids the mirror work. That's a great way to teach them how to start getting back into contact with themselves. That's really good. Mother-in-law reads parenting books to tell me what I'm doing wrong. Holy. Wow. Yeah. You know what? When I have a conversation with somebody like that, I end it really quickly. Gotta go. Somebody's on the other line. Bye. Click. Try not to have conversations with these people. If they start damning you and making you wrong, be done. Have a, have a place to go. Have a, something you have to do. You don't have to sit there and take it. You do not. Okay. All right. Um... Yeah, well, that's one way to separate. <clears throat> so detachment. Detachment is huge. So what I have a lot of people do is that when they have abusive parents or they have abusive in-laws, instead of calling them mom or dad or mom-in-law, dad-in-law, they call them by their first name. You know, it's like they, they take away the title because really when you think about it, if they've been abusive, they don't deserve the title. They don't. You know, they don't deserve the title. They don't deserve the title of grandparent, grandpa, grandma, if they were abusive. You know, they deserve their first name. That's pretty much it. So that's a good way to start separating. That's a good way to start detaching. Okay, let's see. Oh, federal job will do this. Okay, so Sarah, you've got some information on this. If you could help Michelle out, I'd appreciate that because I'm flummoxed. I don't even know what to say other than the truth and keeping it short. So um, police department, okay. Um, all right. Do, 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 do. Uh, okay, they keep putting me down more and more, the more successful I am. Uh, for years, I hid my accomplishments. Now I have all my awards out on display. Yeah, absolutely. They, they want to brag about you, but yet they want to tear you down. That's like trolls. Trolls do the same thing. It's like they so badly want to just tear you down because in their heads, they're comparing themselves against you. And it's like they can't see that they're not you because they don't have any boundaries. So yeah, they think it's going to make them feel better by tearing other people down. And it never does. It never does. Never does. All right. Um, it's crazy how I've never realized how I only call her my MIL. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Call her by her first name. Uh, okay. All right. Let's see. Um, okay. Good, good. Good answer, Beth. So, Michelle, Beth did a really good answer to you. So, that's that's cool. All right. Um, which is, just explain the family is NPD. You are no contact for whatever reason. The panel has seen other toxic families. You won't be the first. Brilliant. Um, yeah, in high school, I adopted my friends' families and tried not to be home very much. Yeah, exactly. You, blood is not always family. It, it's not. It's like your tribe is not always going to be blood-related. Your tribe is going to be your friends that you create. Your family is going to be your family that you create. Because it's not always going to be people who are blood-related to. Because we have to find people who are truly supportive, truly kind, truly healthy, truly, you know, et cetera, to be in our team basically, you know? So yeah, it's okay to go outside a family to find family. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, as a single mom, I get this question a lot. Many employers don't think a woman can handle it all, but once I started working at my current job, that all changed. I've also got a great support system. Good, 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 good. Okay. Um, NARC coworkers, how to deal with that. Okay, I'm going to deal with coworker question later because this is basically about in-laws and toxic parents. So I will address that at some other time. If I don't, could you do me a favor and send an IM and we'll go through it and make sure that it gets on to one of the Q&A questions. Um, okay, what if you're a domestic violence survivor who has to allow visitations with the NARC's father? How do you deal with the idea that you can't stop what's going on? That is the hardest thing ever. So it is frightening for survivors of domestic violence, hang on, to have to send our kids off to 
an abuser knowing that this person is, you know, completely batshit crazy. And how do we deal with that? You're going to have a shit ton of anxiety. You are. You absolutely are. The only thing I can recommend, get with a good therapist, have a great support system, journal, 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 document, 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 document. If those kids come home with so much as a scratch, you take pictures of it and you document it. If they're bruised, you take pictures of it and you document it. If they come home in clothes that are too small for them, you take pictures and you document it. And you just keep doing it. So um, that's really all you can do. You, you know, you talk about as much as you can legally talk about it. So like if there's teacher parent conferences, you let them know high conflict divorce kid is getting sent back and forth. I'm concerned if you could keep an eye on this situation, I would appreciate it. I know it's not the teacher's jobs, but the teachers see them every single day. So, you know, and they're the ones that'll see the behavior going on if they start acting out. So, yeah, it's a horrible situation. And, and it's, and it's nerve-wracking, especially if we're sending little ones to go visit with, you know, the narcissist that we know was violent. So, um, you just keep documenting. That's really all you can do. And you just have a good support system. I really strongly suggest support groups. So, out of the fog dot website, you can contact them and they have um, support groups that you can get a again, like with anything else, remember that there will be predators no matter where you go. So use excuse me, common sense. And if somebody doesn't feel right, trust your gut. Um, but yeah, you're gonna get support and it is nerve wracking. I've got several clients that are in this particular boat and it's heartbreaking to watch them, you know deal with the anxiety and the stress and the fear. It's huge fear. You know, is this person going to harm my child? Is this person going to do this? So you just, you just get with a good support group, get with a good therapist. You document the crap out of everything. And if, and when you can get full custody, do it, do it, do it, do it. Unfortunately, most family systems are loath to sever uh, parental rights. Um, they usually try unless it's really obvious that the person really, really is abusive and absolutely should not have any contact with this child. But um, it's really, it, it's heartbreaking because it's like the judicial system is stuck between a rock and a hard place because it's like they want the kid to have both parents, but yet not every parent needs to have contact with their kid, especially if they're an abuser. And if the abuse was emotional, it's hard to prove. You know, so that's why I'm saying document everything, document everything, document everything, and just get with a really good therapist and get with a good support group because you're going to need it because sending your kid off to a known abuser is heartbreaking and it's frightening and it's terrifying. So you're not wrong. You're not wrong. So get with a good support group out of the fog dot website, contact them. They should have um, some support groups you can get with uh, narcissists, uh, flying monkeys, wait, sociopaths. Narcissist Flying Monkeys, oh my, that's another one you might try to contact to see if there's support groups for that. Um, do that, absolutely. And, and then let as many people around know the situation so they know what to look for. You know, that's really the best advice I can give. Okay, um, how are we doing on time? I got about 15 minutes and then my voice is starting to go, so at two o'clock, I'm, I'm cutting it off. All right. Um, do, 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 do. All right, hang on just a second. Okay. Yeah, this is the danger of telling narcissistic parents that you're pregnant because they'll take over the pregnancy and they'll act as if it's theirs instead of yours. So that's another reason why you don't want to do that. It's like if you're no contact with somebody and you get pregnant, why the hell would you let them know? They don't have a right to share in this joy that you're experiencing. They don't because they'll, they'll ruin it for you. Just like they've ruined everything else. How do I handle this? We have a new baby and my mother hates her name. She has another name she came up with and refuses to call her by her actual name. Only the name she's come up with. She comments on all of my Facebook posts of the baby calling her by her made up name. I'm very frustrated by this. And honestly, it pisses me off. She's doing it on purpose. And now is the time to draw strong boundaries. If you were not related to this person, would you have anything to do with her? If the answer is no, act accordingly. 
Do you see where I'm going with that? I mean, that's, that's a respect thing. She is disrespecting you and it is on purpose and she's doing it publicly and she's looking for a fight. So don't give it to her. You just, you know, if this is not somebody you really want in your life, you don't have her in your life. Is this a deal breaker? That's the question. Is this a deal breaker? And if it is, you act accordingly. Absolutely. It's a disrespect. Um, okay. Yeah, absolutely. They will also harm pets. They'll harm pets. They'll harm kids. If you don't trust them with you, why would you trust them with a dog or a cat or, you know, your kids? Don't. 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 Just don't do it. Uh, I feel like my parents still don't believe me about the abuse I faced from my sister. When I'm um, standing up for myself and what I want, I'm told maybe they'll change. Don't put me in the middle. Even though all I'm saying is I don't want to be around her unless it's at family events and will not go to her home under any circumstances. What can I do? Um, they're, <laughs> okay. They are encouraging the abuse. So anybody who plays Switzerland is a flying monkey. And again, we do not negotiate with terrorists and you have a right to say no. And for them to say, okay, I gave birth to this child, but I'm not going to be put in the middle to try to protect my one child from the other. Fuck that shit. They're not doing what a normal parent would do. And in a normal family, there wouldn't be to the point where the siblings were like at each other. Okay. Because it's been encouraged. So um, you have a right to say no. You have a right to say no. You have a right not to be around her. You have a right not to go to family events if she's there. And uh, no, no, uh, you don't need to explain yourself and you don't need to uh, do anything other than I refuse to be around this woman. I will not do it. If I were not related to her, I would have nothing to do with her. And it sounds to me like that might be the thing with the parents as well. So, you know, when a parent refuses to protect a child, against a sibling, that's a huge red flag that there's a lot more going on, if that makes any sort of sense. So this is a boundary issue. Draw the boundary. Don't put up with it. Absolutely. All right. My 92-year-old mother complains about my sister every single time I talk to her. They are both cluster B. It drags me down. Since she's so elderly, is there anything I can do? No. So the older they get, the more negativity they get, the more they want to talk about the bad stuff. They don't want to hear when the good stuff happens. I, you know, the good stuff will happen and they'll be like, mm -hmm, yeah, got to go, click. But if you're telling them that you had a root canal and everything's horrible, oh, tell me more. So they love the negativity and that's just the way they are. So the only thing you can do is if you still want to be around them is you limit your time. Limit your time. If, if it's so negative, what you do is you do... 15 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour. You don't have to do a full hour. You know, it's like, oh, look, gotta go, gotta catch a bus, gotta get dentistry done, gotta go grocery shopping, gotta whatevs. Do you see where I'm going with that? You don't have to put up with it. Absolutely. All right. We had a huge crisis life event. Family showed their true colors and were not there for us um, and made it about them. We found true friends who helped us and have become a family. Yeah, absolutely. Weddings, funerals, uh, births, you know, deaths, these will all show true colors of people. They, you will. You'll know who your friends are when you have a wedding, a funeral, a birth, or a death. Because that's when people's real, real selves come out. Absolutely. Okay. Let's see. Um... <laughs> If you've done the DNA with ancestry, you realize that you're blood related to half the population anyway. So blood relation doesn't mean much anymore. <laughs> I love it. That's great. That's awesome. Thank you for the laugh. That was, oh, I'm going to give you a little smiley face because that was funny. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay. So I think what I'm going to do next week is I'm going to deal more with uh, toxic siblings, but I still want to revisit toxic parents and toxic in-laws because I don't think we covered everything and I'm running out of time. So next week, let's do a part two. So we're going to do part two about toxic in-laws. We're going to do a part two about toxic parents and then we're going to add in siblings. Um, so the work thing, I think we're going to have to move to maybe a Q and A, you know, how to deal with coworkers and stuff like that, or we'll have to do it on another Sunday. But I think this is important enough because I've already burned through almost two hours and we've got still more questions. Ah!
Okay, and I have questions down here on my iPad that I haven't had a chance to get to. So um, I want to make sure to cover everything because there were so many really good questions. So hang on just a second. Um, oh my God. Jeez Louise. Yeah, so yeah, in laws that are narcissistic, if we have a miscarriage, they won't care. They don't want to hear it. They just, oh, are you okay physically? Okay, I, I don't want to deal with the emotions. Because they can't cope with emotions, guys. They cannot cope with emotions. They, they don't know how to deal with sadness. They don't even know how to deal with loss or grief or anger or anything because they're not, they don't have that cog. So anybody who's unwilling to sit and be with a person when they're being emotional, you're probably dealing with a narcissist. They don't know how to cope with emotions. Because a normal, healthy human being who's got emotions themselves and has the empathy is able to sit with a person while they're going through this horrific time. So, yeah, if an in-law calls up and goes, oh, yeah, you miscarried. Oh, I just want to make sure you're okay physically, but I don't care about you emotionally. I'm sorry. That's bullshit. Yeah, you're, mm, that's not normal. That's not normal. So, yeah, you're not wrong about that. Um, okay. All right, let's see, hang on. Um, I don't know what emotional support is, so I don't know how to have real friends or to truly, who to give me truly support. I don't know how to choose a boyfriend. So first of all, honey, you can't choose a boyfriend right now because you don't know who you are. So you've got to work on you. You have to get with a good therapist. You have to work on self-esteem with the self-esteem workbook by Sheraldi. You have to work on boundaries with Harriet Breaker, um, either the who's pulling your strings and or uh, the disease to please by Harriet Breaker. You need to work on CPTSD from surviving to thriving by Pete Walker. You need to start listening to your gut. That's what I'm saying. Work with a therapist because you're not, your picker's broken. Your picker is broken. You cannot possibly know who is good support and who isn't good support until you know who you are. So work on you. You are worth it. You above all other people on the face of this planet are worthy of your own love, your own time, and your own attention. Work on you. It's okay. Give yourself permission. So get with a good therapist. Start doing uh, the mirror work. Start working on all the workbooks that I've talked about. And yeah, start, be alone for a while. And there's a difference between being alone and being lonely. When we're lonely, it's because we're in our head and we're, oh my God, I need somebody else. I need somebody else. I need somebody outside. Uh-uh. You need the inside. You need you. That's self-esteem. That's standing on your own. Other esteem looks like this. Self-esteem looks like this, standing on our own. So work on you. You are worthy of that. Five more minutes and then I got to go. Um, okay. Uh, all right. Yes, they are jealous of, of relationships with our children. They are jealous of relationships with our pets. Um, they have been known to kill pets. They have been known to harm children um, because they're jealous. And, and they'll say things like, well, you spend too much time with your child. You need to spend less time with your child and more with me. And it's like, whoa, that's a narcissist. So if somebody says, a romantic partner says that to you, run. Do not walk to the nearest exit, seriously. Okay. Okay. Teach the kids about the red flags of abuse. Excellent. Very good. Um, how do I send you an IM? Okay. So if you guys want to send IMs, you're going to go to the We Need to Talk page on Facebook and you're just going to send me an instant message there. My interns go through that and then they send me on the relative um, information. So in other words, if you send me a novel, I'm not going to see it, guys, because I don't have time. They don't have time. So they're just going to send me the, like, the, the quick little question, that kind of thing. And they only send me stuff that is, is relevant. So, um, so quick questions, maybe five sentences at the most. I don't need to know the whole story. So yeah, you can send an IM to uh, We Need to Talk on Facebook. Absolutely. Oh, I can hear it in my voice. Three minutes. Hold on. Uh, okay. Um, thank you so much for today. I feel validated. Good. Yay. Um, standing up for yourself is absolutely okay. You fucking go. You stand up for you. Absolutely. Okay. The show is giving me the strength and confidence and the validation. Uh, is incredible. I cannot say thank you enough. You're so welcome, Sarah. Absolutely. Um, how do you know who you are? I think I know who I am after doing work on me, but do I really know? Trust your gut. Trust your gut. Trust your gut. This will lie to you. This will lie to you. These two will tell stories. The gut 
will tell you the truth. It will. And it's a yes or no. So you play with who you are. Who are you? You know, who are you? Are you empathic? Yeah. Are you honest? Yeah. Are you filled with integrity? Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Trust your gut. Trust your gut. Don't trust this stuff. Trust your gut. So start working with a therapist. Really start working in that. And, and honor who you are. So once you start figuring out who you are, let's say that all of a sudden you realize, oh, I used to like to draw, or I used to like to sing, or I used to like to do this out of the other thing. Do it. That is part of who you are. Honor who you are. Our abuser wanted to erase us. They wanted to take us away from us so that they could mold us into them. Don't let them. Be you. What are you? What do you love? Do what you love. Go do it. Explore. Have fun with figuring out who you are again. Don't look at it as a, oh, I have to figure out who I am. No, I get to. I get to figure out who I am. I get to do things that I used to do before the abuser. Absolutely. Go do it. So if your parents sabotaged your dancing, go take some dance classes. If your parents sabotaged your writing, start writing. If your parents sabotaged your singing, start singing. If your romantic partner made it so that you couldn't do stand-up comedy anymore, go do stand-up comedy. Seriously, that's... Do it. Just fucking do it. Okay. All right. Okay. We are out of time, guys. Thank you so very much. Um, get your questions together. This would be really cool if you could IM me those questions for next week's show. So next week, I'm going to continue talking about toxic in-laws, toxic parents, and this time we're going to add in the toxic siblings, how to deal with that. I hope that answered everybody's questions. Have a wonderful week. Try to throw in a Q&A session if I can this week. I'm not sure that I'm going to have time. Um, uh, Honolulu is going to be November 10th, I believe, which is the Saturday. Um, so uh, that's it. Uh, have a great week, guys, and I will talk to you later. Bye.